Hi, welcome back to IU Radiology Case of the Day. My name is Nick Kuntz, and I'm a neuroradiologist and head and neck imager at Indiana University School of Medicine. And I'm back today with another interesting head and neck radiology case of the day. As always, the educational content that's found within these talks has been completely de-identified in order to protect patient privacy. So this is a patient who was in her late 30s, and uh, they found that she was very difficult to intubate whenever she was having an elective procedure done. So I have four images for you to take a look at. The image on the left is an axial contrast enhanced CT. The image uh, second from the left is a coronal stir. Uh, the image second from the right is an axial T2 weighted image, this time at the level of the nasopharynx. And then the image on the right is sort of a magnified coronal T1 post-contrast fat-saturated image. So keep in mind that history. We've got a patient who's in their late 30s, and they had a difficult intubation. And I'll tell you, there was no additional past medical history for this patient. So take a look at these images. Try to piece together what you think might be happening here. Okay, so what are the findings? What's your differential diagnosis when you see this kind of pattern? And what's your top diagnosis based upon the clinical information that I gave you and the imaging findings that I put forth in front of you? Okay, so let's take a look at the imaging. First up, we have an axial contrast enhanced CT. And what you'll see is uh, we're at the level uh, just below the hyoid bone. And you can see where the yellow arrow is pointing, we have a very large supraglottic laryngeal mass. Now, if you take a closer look at this uh, mass, you'll see that it's actually quite circumscribed. If you wanted to, you could take a pin and trace around the margins of this mass. Now, the enhancement, the attenuation of this mass, it's a bit heterogeneous. Some of it's a little bit dense. Some of it's a little bit lower density. In general, it's somewhere on the order of the density of skeletal muscle. Uh, but again, there are some internal areas that are of lower density. But as I said before, you could take a pin and trace the margins of this mass. We don't see anywhere where it looks like it has deep invasion. It's sort of pushing things out of the way, but it doesn't look like it's really uh, being aggressive and working its way through the tissue planes, just sort of gently pushing things aside. Now, importantly, in this case, there was near complete airway effacement, and that's uh, something that they found out as uh, the patient was needing to be intubated. So uh, this is something that obviously, just because it be looks like it's uh, demonstrating some fairly benign features, that doesn't necessarily mean that it keeps the patient out of trouble. In this case, it was a bad actor on account of the airway compromise. Next up is the uh, coronal stir image, and you'll see that there are additional masses within the neck. So the one in the supraglottic larynx wasn't the only one. Uh, you can see the yellow arrow here is pointing to a mass that's found in the suprahyoid neck. This was in the carotid space. You can see it adjacent to the uh, carotid artery. And we have additional masses that are in the supra and, and uh, infraclavicular fossa on the left. Uh, and these course along with where we would expect to see the brachial plexus. That's an important clue to try to come up with a diagnosis here. Here's an axial T2 weighted image. This is through the level of the nasopharynx, and this is looking in cross section at that T2 bright mass that we saw in the carotid space at the level of the nasopharynx. And you can see that predominantly this mass is T2 bright, but internally, right in the middle of it, we have a very bright uh, central region. So when you see this kind of pattern, you wonder, am I dealing with an intramural cyst, like in a schwannoma, or is this potentially necrosis, like you might see uh, in something that's more of an aggressive mass? Lastly, we've got our coronal T1 post-contrast fat-saturated uh, images to look at. You can see that uh, this, uh, these masses were avidly enhancing, but they're inhomogeneously enhancing. You can see that the areas that were T2 bright, the cystic or necrotic areas, uh, are non-enhancing. Um, the other thing to keep in mind as you look at this, again, is look at the mar uh, margins in morphology. We don't see any sort of extra capsular enhancement. We don't see any infiltration into the surrounding soft tissues. These look like they're circumscribed and well-behaved. So what's your differential diagnosis? Again, we have a mass. It's circumscribed. It's a bit heterogeneous in signal intensity and, and attenuation. It may have some internal cystic areas. 
It's located in the supraglottic larynx, but we have similar appearing masses that are seen along the carotid space in the level of the uh, nasopharynx, and then in the supraclavicular and infraclavicular fossa region uh, on the left, sort of right along the region where we'd expect the brachial plexus and um, branches uh, of nerves in the neck. So what's our top diagnosis here? Well, this was a patient with schwannomatosis, and these patients have multiple schwannomas without involvement of the vestibular nerves. Now, bilateral vestibular nerve involvement is a hallmark, essentially a pathognomonic feature of NF2. Well, in this case, one of the features of schwannomatosis is you cannot have a schwannoma involving the vestibular nerve. So despite the name schwannomatosis, this is one of those etiologies that's to some degree a bit poorly, um, poorly named because um, uh, more recent studies have shown that somewhere on the order of 5% or less of these patients will also have uh, meningiomas. Uh, but I want to stress, even though uh, a very small minority can have meningiomas, this is an entirely separate disease uh, entity from neurofibromatosis type 2. This is caused by a germ mutation in the SMARC-B1 uh, gene, uh, much less commonly in the LZTR1 gene. Now, interestingly, that SMARC-B1 gene is the same gene that's uh, uh, implicated with uh, some aggressive sinonasal tumors in the head and neck, as well as some GU uh, tumors, uh, oftentimes uh, in the pediatric patient population. But different mutations result in different problems, and the problem here is that they have multiple, uh, multiple schwannomas. And importantly, this has a different clinical presentation than NF2. Schwannomatosis patients tend to present with pain, whereas NF2 patients more commonly have neurological deficits as a result of their tumors. And importantly, these patients with schwannomatosis have a normal life expectancy, which is different than NF2, uh, in which those patients have a reduced life expectancy. Uh, it's very uncommon. Its incidence has been reported between 1 in 40,000 and uh, about 1 in 1.7 million. Uh, but most sources suggest that its incidence is probably similar to that of NF2, so probably more on the lower end of that spectrum. Um, so it, it's thought that because of that reason, as, as well as the fact that these uh, are probably misdiagnosed as NF2 patients, the incidence is probably underestimated. Um, importantly, these patients have a different peak of onset compared to NF2 patients. The uh, typical peak, typical time of diagnosis for schwannomatosis is between ages 30 and 60. And uh, there's no gender predilection. Now, interestingly with, interestingly, with NF2, most of those patients are diagnosed between ages 17 and 24. So effectively, a full decade of life younger at time of diagnosis uh, for NF2 than it is for schwannomatosis. So there are some baseline diagnostic criteria. As the name would imply, you do need to have multiple schwannomas. You cannot have a germline NF2 mutation because, again, this is a totally different syndrome, totally different genetic etiology. You can't meet any diagnostic criteria for NF2. You can't have a first degree family member with NF2, and you cannot have a vestibular schwannoma on MRI. Those are all things that would preclude the diagnosis of schwannomatosis. Now, importantly, these schwannomas cannot be in a prior radiation field because you can have radiation induced schwannomas, uh, and that would not put you into uh, this genetic mutation um, that is responsible for schwannomatosis. So here's a, a paper that we wrote several years back um, looking at schwannomatosis and uh, really contrasting it to NF1 and NF2, which uh, originally this had the very poor name of NF3, uh, which caused nothing but confusion. So the appropriate terminology is to call it schwannomatosis, um, but it's worth checking out uh, for a nice review of the differences between these uh, entities. Okay, so let's wrap this up. Again, our diagnosis here was schwannomatosis. And the key imaging features you need to know about, first of all, these patients will have multiple circumscribed encapsulated masses. And those tend to follow the expected course of cranial or peripheral nerves. Now these schwannomas can occur literally anywhere because you've got nerves all throughout your body, but look for those typical locations of the big named nerves of the cranial nerves. And that can be a clue that you're dealing with schwannomas. Importantly, these patients cannot have vestibular schwannomas. One of the pitfalls to keep in mind is that this can be misdiagnosed as NF2. So keep in mind that possibility of schwannomatosis, particularly in patients that are older than age 30, who have multiple schwannomas, and in particular, those that spare the vestibular nerves. 
And again, this is a distinct entity from NF2, so don't confuse the two. Uh, and that's important because you can give predictive value to these patients by saying, you know what, you've got schwannomatosis, you're gonna have a normal life expectancy. If it's NF2, you're less likely to have a normal life expectancy. Um, another feature that I hinted at before that I think can be helpful is to keep in mind that as your age at time of initial diagnosis increases, it's more likely that you're dealing with schwannomatosis and less likely that you're dealing with NF2. So as always, thanks for tuning in to IU Radiology Case of the Day. Again, my name is Nick Kuntz, and you can follow along with uh, IU Radiology Case of the Day on Twitter at N.A. Kuntz. And I would invite you to check out our complete collection of IU Radiology Case of the Day material, which can be found on our web uh, website at radtf.iuhealth.org slash COTD. Thanks so much.